I don't think there was anybody who came to the University of Texas as a black student in 1956 who wasn't perfectly aware of what the University of Texas was and the kind of environment that they were going to be entering. I was born in San Antonio, Texas. I attended public and parochial schools. I climbed trees and jumped from them, played softball and inadvertently sometimes baseball. We met in high school. We took algebra from the same professor. This teacher always kept very good records concerning, and he gave lots of tests. He kept the scores in his, his little book. And uh, the result was that Leon was only three-tenths off a point. You know, his was only that much higher than mine. A win is a win. <laughs> oh, oh. 1956, you're talking about a time in which we're in deep segregation in the state of Texas and elsewhere. Texas in general was an apartheid state and racial violence was not, you know, not something that people uh, hadn't experienced here in, in Texas. Texas is one of the, the major lynching states in the country. I can't say that racism entered into my early growing up period to an extent. I mean, I, it existed. After graduating as a valedictorian of the Phyllis Wheatley High School class of 1956, I enrolled in San Antonio Junior College during the fall. After completing my Associate of Arts degree, I enrolled at the University of Texas in Austin in September of 1958. Liam was in the first group of black undergraduates who came on campus in 1956. The University of Texas was strictly segregated when Leon got here and when Peggy got here two years later. One of the things to remember about that is that's two years after Brown versus the Board of Education, way before City of Austin public schools are integrating. Well, oblivious as I was to many things, Coming here, I didn't give it too much thought. I didn't think about race again or anything. I didn't think about it there. They just, I never thought about it until somebody pushed it into my face. I, mean, I recognized it when I saw what was going on. Uh, when she got here, was unable to stay on campus because there was no housing for, uh, for black women on campus. So black students were housed separately and they pretty much stayed to themselves. Black students couldn't eat on the drag. It was pretty socially isolated. I guess in the early 60s, this is when we started protesting and demonstrating. I think there were racial incidents. The N-word was used from time to time. People described teachers who weren't willing to teach them or have them in the classroom, although that wasn't the majority of teachers. I had no relationship with the students. If I came into the room and sat down near, just anywhere near them, they got up and left and found it more convenient to sit elsewhere. So here, I took it as it came. I didn't, I didn't form any opinions because it was a big place. And I always said, the more education you have, the less prejudice you should be. But that was not the case here. But I also ran to some really stellar people who were of the different race. Some really, you know, people who cared. There were a lot of people who did not complete, who couldn't take it. Some of those, as been described to me, were the most able, in some sense the brightest and all that, but they didn't have the resilience. In other words, you had to be able to bend with the blows enough to be able to make it through. It's just something I had to just adapt to in order to get an education. And that's what I considered it, just a minor inconvenience. I found that really refreshing. I just loved to bowl. And 
there, I was the only girl bowling with all these boys. These boys, but you know, see, the boy said, if you beat us, we'll pay for your game. I never paid for a game. <laughs> I mean, I never, never did. There were a lot of people who were brave, uh, and there are a lot of people who got broken. Um, but there aren't a whole bunch of people who are able to both be brave and push forward and have <laughs> grace and class at the same time. You know, grace has both a spiritual and uh, kind of an ethical and also a kind of an emotional aspect to it that I think is, is, is very important. People talk a lot about having heard that, particularly in Peggy's situation, being the only person in business and being business what it evidently was at the time, that she uh, underwent you know, some incidents and other kinds of experiences, particularly in terms of faculty, that others didn't have to. I did leave to go work, but I knew I was coming. I planned to come back, but I went, I, I left, and I, I really needed to get rid of some of the stress. I mean, I always said I'm coming back and conquer this problem. I can't leave things unfinished. I came here, I wasn't gonna start something and not finish it. And I didn't want to disappoint my mother and my grandfather. They had such hopes for me. That's what I mean like by bending with the blows. It's not enough to be strong. You have to also have the grace and the class to be able to survive in those contexts. And that's what people say about Peggy Holland. My good feeling came when I came back here to the university and People told me how much they appreciated what I had done, and I didn't think in terms of what I was doing. Now I feel that if I really did something to help them, and help them feel good, or accomplish some goal or something, then that's what made me feel good, when, to hear that. Because I hadn't put in place that I had done anything exceptional and these little children come up and, <laughs> and they say these nice things and I say, well that merely makes me feel good. I don't feel like I, you know, was exceptional, but I really feel good that they thought of me in that light and that that was something that motivated them. Every once in a while you see a person who just makes a statement grace and class. There are only a few who had the qualities of class and grace that she did. 